So, hello and welcome everyone to today's uh, Frontiers Lecture. Our speaker today is Professor Jonathan Sweeper, who is currently the James R. Eisner Chair in Chemistry and the Director for the School of Chemical Sciences. So most of his research focuses on the development of bioanalytical platforms to characterize the neurochemistry of the brain and related systems, looking at anything from tissues down to single cells and organelles. So please help me in welcome Jonathan Sweeper. Thank you all, and uh, hopefully at least the one person can hear me and Oh, I like the background. I was going to say I'm looking at myself with the brain behind me, but there is none. Okay. Um, but anyway, um, welcome all. Um, today, what I wanted to do is kind of give you, um, my group does a couple different things, but a flavor for our single cell measurements. Uh, I picked this because it seems like it's appropriate in um, uh, a, a training grant that uh, works on uh, engineering and neuroscience combination. Now, as I stand up here, as most of you are aware, um, I actually don't do the research. I get to talk about it. And a lot of the people in the room and the others uh, get the credit. This is sort of, I'm showing data over a period of several years, uh, anything from, uh, you know, the, uh, on the far right to last year, right before the pandemic started, to what is more uh, typical group meeting these days, unfortunately. Uh, we're just starting to go back to in person. We'll see how that works. But these are the ones uh, that do the research. And let me... Okay, good. So uh, why do single cell chemical analysis, uh, and what do we mean by that? Um, I guess I won't wander over to the screen as I normally do, but uh, sort of uh, use. So the cells of many organs, including the brain, are heterogeneous, and this heterogeneity underlines health and disease. It underlies, uh, for example, processes like learning and memory. Uh, and in some cases, the state of a single cell can change animal behavior. And so uh, those are some of the reasons. So the other thing is that if an individual cell has a specific, unusual neurochemical pathway, if you study that cell, it's much more likely that you'll see it. Now, uh, most people don't tend to think of it this way, but if you even think of um, a brain region like the Raffae uh, where it makes serotonin, most of the cells in that area still aren't making serotonin. It's a small fraction. And so if you find the cell that does that, uh, you can learn something. Another example actually is within the Raffae. Uh, one in a thousand neurons actually are also nitrogen. Well, NO can react with serotonin to form nitrososerotonin, but that would only be in one in a thousand to one in 10,000 cells. And so if you find that cell, you actually will see those neurochemical pathways. You'll see those molecules at much higher levels, and that allows you to understand them uh, and um, follow their significance. Lastly, um, it's really useful to probe the unexpected. And I like to put that up because... Um, these approaches will work on unusual animals. We've done some of that with a lot of collaborators, unusual cells, and even uh, unusual engineered brains. For example, uh, that's one of the reasons I'm in this room, is so we can uh, work with, for example, brain organoids. So I like this slide. I've used it before. Um, but it sort of is both a depressing and an exciting slide. It basically says, uh, 2,000 years ago, Aristotle predicted you know, that, you know, try to understand what memory is and, and came up with a, uh, basically a, a couple metaphors of how it worked. And what I find depressing and exciting both is 2,000 years later, we're still studying the same question. And so that's um, sort of interesting. Um, you know, you could also ask what is consciousness and a lot of other questions that were asked long ago. Uh, what's fun about the memory question is we're actually at the point now where we can start addressing whether it really is you know, chemistry, the interplay of chemistry and transcriptomics, and then shape and morphology. And all of the tools have gotten to the point where we can study what's happening in and around individual cells, for example, uh, during memory formation. And so uh, one other background slide, and I put this up for two reasons. One is it shows neurons talking to each other, but the other reason is it shows neurons uh, in this model are mostly empty, you know, are surrounded by empty space. Now, if you look at a slice of brain, there's no empty space. Those are all the other cells, uh, depending on what textbook or Wikipedia entry you look at, um, neurons make up 20 to 30 percent of the cells in the brain, sometimes 10 percent, sometimes 50 percent. Uh, but uh, by other accounts, there's almost as many red blood cells in your you know, had as there are neurons. And nobody really thinks about the fact that if you were to somehow take a brain and measure uh, 
what was in it, you wouldn't really expect one of the largest proteins you would see would be hemoglobin. And yet there's obviously a lot of it in the brain. And so there are reasons to go to single cells uh, because it gets you to the functional unit. I'm going to come back to this uh, a little later in this talk. So the other thing, uh, which I find very surprising, in the year 2021, we don't even know the parts list uh, of the brain. Now, this is something Martha long ago with I, you know, we, uh, and a few others, we came up with something called the, well, uh, a critical research initiative, trying to come up with a parts list of the cell. And I find it interesting is that uh, this is still being debated, but there's probably 50,000 chemical entities known as lipids in your brain, different chain lengths, different sites of unsaturation. And even if defects in a few of these will change the ability of cells to extend processes, because if you have a sharp corner from a near an axon hillock, if you don't have the right lipid, it will leak. You can't form, uh, you know, a, a lipid bilayer that will, um, for example, keep ions in or out. And, um, you know, another way to look at it is, you know, people get upset when I say this, but your brain is like a bar of butter. And what I mean by that is it's mostly water in lipids with a few other molecules thrown in. And amazingly enough, when we talk about lipids, a significant fraction of the energy of the brain is replacing all of those lipids every few weeks because they oxidize and destroy it. So a huge amount of energy goes into keeping these lipids new. The interesting part of that is your brain can't make most of them. It has to be made in the liver, in your diet, in the gut microbiome, and it's transporting. What are they doing and even what, are they, are, what they are is not very well known. And then, of course, there's things like proteins and signaling molecules, and we work on all of these. This is a timeline, and you can argue with any point of this, um, except maybe the beginning. Uh, I like to point out that you know people have been looking at individual cells since the 1600s of either Hooke or Leon Hoek. Um, they got to name all the cells. And so that's why when you look at cell names, they're named by shape, astrocytes, pyramidal cells, other things like that, because, of course, they've had hundreds of years to pick shape. If a chemist named cells, they would have called them dopaminergic, acetylcholinergic, because, hey, those are important molecules. But there's lots of ways to name cells. Um, but now what we know is if you take a cell type that's defined, whether there's an astronite or astrocyte or others, it could be that they have very different neurochemistry, even though they're the same cell type, because that's not really the way cell types were originally defined. And then, of course, the last 20 years have seen a big explosion in our ability to do chemistry. So to those in my group not on this slide, I put this up because... This is the most recent and one of the few pictures um, that we just had taken in the lab only up a couple weeks ago about a recent paper that came out in Nature Methods on single organelle measurements. But we use a lot of tools. I also use this slide because I just talked for a Bruker user group and they wanted to know the Bruker instruments. And so I put that up. And so um, we use other pieces of equipment. But we have a lot of mass spectrometers. These are the arguably the most chemically information rich uh, characterization methods. And I'm not going to talk too much about about these outside of showing you how we use them. So how would you measure a cell? Well, the tried and true approach is shown on this slide, and it's basically you somehow isolate the cell. You can isolate the cell using laser capture microdissection. You can use tweezers. You can use uh, Stas Rubakin in the group. He does a really good job. So people can learn to do this. Um, there's a lot of different ways you can do cell culture, um, and we use all of them. And then what you, you know, and then the other thing we do when we worked on for quite a while is microfluidic sampling. Um, we've worked on a couple other approaches. Once you isolate the cell, um, I was hoping I would see a laser pointer, but that's, um, you can then separate the contents and introduce them into a mass spectrometer. So individual bands will tell you what's there. And this works um, surprisingly well. This is just a very old slide that shows that we did it with how we do this with our favorite model organism, Aplesia californica. Um, this is a Nobel Prize winning animal uh, that's been studied for uh, quite a while because it's a, well, it's a lousy genetic mo model. It has a very complex development, uh, 10 instars during development. It changes uh, nervous system and everything changes. However, it's a great physiological model where you can find individual cells and relate them to an animal behavior. You can relate them um, to triggering uh, you know, uh, particular behaviors like feeding, reproduction, uh, escape. And so we can take these known cells, isolate them. They're a little bit bigger and they uh, are easier to work with. And then we can do this approach, capillectivresis coupled with mass spec. We've been doing this for 20 years. It works well. Rather than dwell on that, I just wanted to say it doesn't require big cells. 
The sensitivity of mass spec allows us to go to small cells. Um, I have somebody in my group um, who could take out three to five micron cells from a fruit fly, not any cell, but specific cells. So these were fruit flies labeled with a fluorescent reporter so that they, we knew which ones were, for example, uh, dopaminergic or octopaminergic using octopamine or dopamine. You can isolate those cells, stick them right in the end of the capillary and do you know, capillary electrophoresis mass spec and quantify in green cells or other cells how much of a compound was present. This works really well. And if the individual had a good day, they can isolate 10 cells in a day. In a bad day, it would be two or three because it also means you weren't drinking coffee or doing other things, and isolating cells can be hard. You could also, one last example of this before I tell you how we really do the work these days, this is some work with Lee Cox, so it dates it, it's about seven years old, where we use the patch clamp uh, sampling approach. This is a, a Nobel Prize winning approach uh, where you can actually stick a capillary on the end of the cell. You can, you know, this Nobel Prize was given to Nayer and Sackman because they learned how to fire polish glass that sounds ludicrous, but fire polished glass will form a great seal with a membrane, a giga-ohm seal. You can sample a picoliter or less of material. That's enough that if you suck it into a capillary, you can get the metabolites, including neurotransmitters, within that cell. Again, this works well. These were living cells. We know they're living because it's a brain slice. In this case, it's an alignment reticular neuron, and you can see the action potentials. You can see that during the entire sampling, you know, you're still seeing the whole Mars activity. You can even learn things like spontaneously active thalamic reticular neurons have higher levels of histamine, which was not known. So this works. You can even patch onto an astrocyte and see different characteristics. But again, it's very slow. And when you consider a microliter of rodent brain has a couple hundred thousand cells, uh, it's a problem. So what I want to do is show you how we've made this high throughput, how we're making this work for... Uh, a lot of collaborators we're working with, but I'm going to do that when I talk about not the small molecules, but the neuropeptides. Um, uh, I like this quote from uh, Chuck Stevens, who said that four of the seven deadly sins are mediated by neuropeptides. They decide if you're hungry or overeating, uh, if you're attracted to somebody, and a lot of other behaviors, that good and bad. The problem with neuropeptides is that you tend to think of something like this as a gene product, DNA, RNA, protein. but the protein made by the gene, for example, uh, for neuropeptide Y or POMC or other peptides, is actually not active. It has to be modified by a large number of enzymes that make it biologically active, and those enzymes differ in a cell-specific way. So you can even get different products in different cells. I'll show you an example of that in a little bit. So you can't actually use transcriptomics to know what peptides are present in a cell. You really have to measure it, which is both good for my group and makes this field a little bit hard. I'm gonna probably skip this, but this is a biochemical way of looking at a peptide and every bar represents a peptide from one gene product. This is very complicated. One just funny fun fact is that in the past to identify the peptide through about the 80s, it took samples that look like this. Victor Mutt discovered a lot of neuropeptides. He discovered the trick that even though they're in the brain, you could find similar peptides in the gut and this is one of his samples. So this was a delivery of uh, about four tons of pig intestines, and then they extracted the peptides from those to then determine what they are. And I just can't even imagine what it was like to work in his lab. But, um, you know, graduate students have it easy compared to, I think, uh, those individuals. So this is how we really do this. This is just showing you um, one way to do this. You can isolate a cell. You can grow a cell if you... Uh, shine a laser at this and blast it, you get something that looks like that. Pieces fly off into the mass spectrometer. And on the right, it shows individual cells with one missing. And that missing cell created the spectra on the bottom. And if you know what those peaks are, you can then sort of guess at um, what they do if you know something about that cell. So up to now, I've been sort of saying, this is what we've done, and now I'm going to switch gears. By the way, nothing is new about this. This is some work by... Franz Hillenkamp, he gave them to me in uh, 2006, but this is actually some slides of his from 1974 where he shined a laser on tissue. I think this was the first ever example of something like this, and everywhere there's a hole, he got a mass spectra. Now, in 1974, when he did this, 
mass spectrometers weren't very good. He didn't identify the peaks. But, you know, this is actually not a new approach. So that's what we do, but this is how we really do it now. So first, um, I want to say our, the mass spectrometer in this uh, Beckman Institute has the ability to detect very small amounts. This is, happens to be a peptide you can get from sigma, so it's angiotensin. Um, but what we did is we added 60 femtomoles down using a, a, a deposition approach, um, Shimazu chem printer down to about 300 zeptomoles, and our detection limits are about 100 zeptomoles, which is about what people predict would be in one's dense core vesicle. So that tells you how sensitive this is. So this is how we do it, and this is just showing you there's lots of ways to do high throughput measurements. But what we, what a lot of people have tried to do is use microfluidics to line these up in neat arrays. You can deposit one cell if you have a hydrophobic hydrophilic. Maybe some would have zero, some would have two. And when I was looking at that, this is some really fun work with a uh, collaborator and colleague of mine, Renato Zanobi from Eteha, I said, we don't have to be that specific because he had to tailor this depending on the size of the cell. We just throw the cells all over a microscope slide. And when you do that, you get something that looks like on the right, there's a few cells, there's garbage, there's cell debris, and then we just find them. And rather than image, we actually just target them and, and we never miss a cell. This is actually why life is always complicated. This is really what we do. We disperse the cells, we image them with a microscope. We look at morphology. We look at, are they really cells? Are they well separated? We then take those spots, enter them into a mass spectrometer coordinate system, depending on what the instrument is. We hit the cells, and then we can go on with informatics. And so this is how the system works. Now, I'm going to give you an example that's not brain. And this is an area that quite a few people in the group are working on. This started because when we tried to publish some of this, people said, I don't believe your data prove you're seeing the right material. Well, I don't know. There's no standard cell. I, don't, I mean, I can see what I'm seeing, but I don't know what I'm missing. So I said, what is the best peptide characterized cell that exists? And that's going to be an islet because it has alpha, beta, and gamma cells that make insulin, glucagon. So this was really my attempt to, buy, to, to use standard cells. And when I did that with unsupervised you know, learning, our system identified cell types that were canonical alpha, beta, gamma, and delta cells that had insulin, glucagon, pancreatic hormone, uh, and this worked really well. We even discovered heterogeneity that no one knew was there. In this case, again, this biochemical way of doing it, pancreatic hormone has a canonical arch, arch. In mammals, that's not supposed to be cleaved often. It's KRs are cleaved, but it turns out if it does cleave, you make a peptide that weighs that molecular weight, and it's kind of hard to see, but in the ventral part of a rodent islet, there's a few cells that has a lot of that. So these presumably have a new enzyme in them that makes that peptide. What was fun about this is somebody predicted, a couple papers, that this might happen. They tested the bioactivity of this shorter peptide and say, wow, it activates a neuropeptide uh, Y for receptor, and it potentiates insulin release. Then they measured it and said, oh, there's none there. So we, the bioactivity was known just that didn't exist. Well, the reason they didn't see it is it's only in a few cells. So even in well-characterized systems, this type of peptide heterogeneity exists. I'm going to skip that and just simply say, the other thing that's fun about this is this approach is non-destructive in the sense that this is using the instrument at Beckman. This is using the exact same cell with an instrument in Roger Adams' lab that has a about 10 times slower but 10 times more chemical information. It also costs about five times more money. I guess that's the way it works. So we can keep on measuring. There is SIMS, which we have in one of the Beckman rooms, and there is Malditoff. So we can measure the same cell multiple times. We can even combine every part of the talk up to now. We can do campylelectrophoresis on a single cell after we did Maldi. This is a metabolomics run from a DRG. And because I was talking about islets, this is Baldy mass spectrometry on alpha cells. I know they're alpha cells because they don't have insulin or pancreatic hormone. They have glucagon. And then we can measure molecules like dopamine in those cells. Now, this was fun because the enzymes to make dopamine in islets had been detected by transcriptomics. But people said it's probably really not functional, and yet we see dopamine in those cells. So this is the type of information you can get. We have moved on since then. Uh, we, American Diabetes Association is supporting this, the Visionary Award. Now we're getting 
transplant quality living islets from humans. We can dissociate the cells. And you can imagine these are organoids, which is sort of, they're sort of on the same scale. We then dissociate the cells. And we can see one donor, four islets. Every dot is an individual cell. They all have the right canonical peptides, but islet four has a lot more of somatostatin, uh, has more insulin. Glucagon is mostly in islet one. Lots of heterogeneity. And now we're starting to look at how this changes, for example, during type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Uh, in interlude, this is some work with um, uh, Elena Romanova, where she used a different instrument, took an entire human islet. So this is a really small sample, but much bigger than a single cell. And she did liquid chromatography mass spectrometry and sees lots of peptides identified in individual islets. Again, these are human islets just taking a really, really, really small subsection of that. This is non-published work. Looking at glucagon, this is this crazy way where every bar is a peptide, and this is what textbooks say. And all these purple bars are peptides that we didn't expect to see in an islet. Some of them are because there's an unusual signal peptide cleavage. Some of them are peptides that should be made in the gut to make oxyntomodulin, which is not made in an islet. When you look at an islet and look at the individual cells, this one cell has lots of this oxyntomodulin. Now, this peptide made in your gut is known to potentiate insulin release, and it's even been shown to change uh, and be upregulated in type 2 diabetes. But nobody expected, though, that it would be made in an islet by an alternative processing of the glucagon prohormone. And what's interesting, again, is it's not a low level peptide everywhere, it's just found in a few cells. And so that's, again, showing some of the heterogeneity. And so again, even in the most well-studied peptide sets, we're finding a really surprising amount of heterogeneity. Now I'm gonna go away from islets and go back to the brain. I do wanna say that one of the interesting things is we're continuing with this work trying to understand this gut, islet, and brain axis because there's a lot of evidence that all three are uh, uh, coupled in this particular case. So going back to what I was talking about, boy, there's a couple hundred thousand different molecules, and I've only talked about a dozen, or a couple dozen, and that's not very good. Uh, it's important molecules. How can we make this a little bit um, broader? So I'm going to show you a couple of examples. I think this is the last old example, then everything is unpublished. This is some work that Fan Do did. Uh, he's now an assistant professor at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. And he used multiple instruments that we had up at the Beckman Institute. And I do want to say, whenever we talk about a single cell, we image it. You can see there's the cell. There's the cell with one, two, close. And then he did mass spec. And I like this because he's doing low molecular weight up to proteins and things up to about 10,000, 15,000 Dalton, so low proteins. And looking at DRGs, he asked the question, you know, okay, what can we see? But how many cell types are we looking at? And so he came up with a statistical approach called the covariance matrix, saying how many peaks are correlated with each other in these different cells. And when he did this, looking at about a 1,000 cells, he says, wow, there's three cell types that have different chemical profiles based on peptides, lipids, uh, and other molecules, and then a few cells that are sort of in between. And I, I'm sort of saying that because I have no idea if these cells in between are caused because they actually are cells that haven't decided if they're an A or B type, or if when we ripped it apart, some of the A stuck to B. So I put this up because this is also an example of I, my instrument can't make that distinction. This is some uh, work where we're scattering individual cells looking at lipids. Now we're going to a seven Tesla instrument. We get more decimal places. Neurons from the cerebellum have an incredible lipid heterogeneity, but we don't know what they are, right? So what are they? And so um, Elizabeth Newman, uh, who's now at Vanderbilt, uh, as a postdoc, uh, did this work, but she basically, it just kind of shows you how we lose cells every step of the way. 500,000 cells on a slide, we analyzed 40,000 by moldy, we dropped the slides after doing moldy into uh, fixative, got rid of the moldy matrix, we had 250,000, 70,000 immunohistochemically uh, positive cells that happened to line up about 2,000 of each. And this just shows you that we can see the cell and they are both, there's a nucleus, host staining, and they're also GFAP or neurofilament allied. We can now say which one of these are neurons or astrocytes. 
and we actually start to see differences in lipids between the two. This is just a clustering approach. This uh, was not known, and if you want to know what specific lipids, it's, some of this was sort of vaguely known, but we're doing you know, upregulation of some of the phosphatidylcholines and PE, so different lipid classes uh, and the molecular weights um, are changed. And what's kind of fun is even a year later, we can go back to a new data set, 30,000 cells, different instrument, different animals, and we can cluster these and we find we still get the same robust clustering between astrocytes and neurons. And we're able to show that uh, even based on uh, lipids like single myelin and others we couldn't see before as we've gotten um, a little bit uh, better at our detection. And that's just showing you this type of difference where we're looking at single myelin for example, in D, and it's actually enriched in what we would call neurons, as opposed to astrocytes. So I wanted to uh, show you some, this is some work that Richard, uh, is, uh, she is doing in my group. Uh, he's a bioengineering uh, graduate student, and he looked at all three of these data sets, the immunochemistry data set, a data set that we did between the hippocampus and cerebellum, and even SIMS between DRG and cerebellum, and said, how well, do these work at distinguishing using, in this particular case, in supervised uh, learning, at distinguishing these? And I find it staggering that within a rodent, we can 96% of the time, looking at just the lipid signals, tell whether we got something from the hippocampus or the cerebellum. Now, why is that interesting? Because most of those cells aren't neurons. They're astrocytes, microglia, oligodendrocytes, and yet there's still a signature of what brain region they came from so that we can tell them apart. Microglia or astrocytes or neurons are not the same in different brain regions. And, you know, between a DRG and a, uh, uh, and a cerebellum, we actually make no, really no mistakes. This is the least quality, and this is probably because of aminohistochemistry. If you looked at the staining, obviously, that's not as digital as knowing which brain region you got it from. And you can then go through this type of approach and look at what mass features, what compounds actually allowed that, and this is something that Richard did is, even though he used machine learning, you can use the Shapley additive explanation to determine, in essence, the spectra that distinguishes between those. So this is a combination of mass spectrometry, machine learning, uh, some really nice informatics that say what is different about these different cells in different brain regions. One study that's currently under review right now, just to show you that we can go to pretty large numbers of cells, this is with Arnold Creekston. Um, this is about 150,000 cells from the developing human brain. Uh, in this case, it was, um, it's kind of exciting because at this developmental stage, there's just no processes, and so we didn't have to rip the, you know, people always say you're losing the active part of the neuron because it's not there, you know, because when you isolate it, but these don't have that. And so again, the process that we're doing, what was interesting about this in two ways. One is when we did this and looked at differences, the largest difference we observed in statistical analysis of these is the person who did the cell isolation, not the biology, but if you actually can account for that when you have hundreds of thousands of cells and millions of features, you actually then can start clustering these and you can actually see a few groups from some brain regions that have very complicated lipid profiles, other specific lipids that change, and this was actually very robust. And so in essence, we've made a lipid atlas. They actually have an atlas that already works for transcriptomics uh, data from the developing. And so we're now adding, in essence, a lipid atlas uh, and a viewer. Hopefully this will be out soon on these 150,000 cells. What we'd like to be able to do eventually is correlate those two exactly on the same cell, and we're not there yet. This is the Beckman Institute. So I'd mentioned you know, a few other things we've uh, with Martha, and uh, Rohit Bhargava, we've actually added more information, in this case, uh, correlated vibrational spectroscopy, both Raman, as well as we have a, a paper that's being uh, modified in infrared. And this is just showing you how much data you can get from a cell. So this is really how we do the work, a bunch of cells. These axes are how we figure out the exact location. This box right here, a small part of the box has five cells, one, two, three, four, five, there they are. You can do bright field, fluorescence, um, Raman, or you can do mass spec, but mass spec didn't take an image, it only has five cells. And when we combine these, I was quite excited by this. This is both uh, uh, cultured cells as well as uh, scattered cells um, from a brain region. When we try to determine how many cell types, MALDI mass spectrometry gives you some information, a little less, 
distinction by Raman, but when you combine them, you actually can completely segregate three cell types very robustly. And it's not by region, but they're pretty um, uh, mixed. And so um, we're starting to get information by combining these. They give you very different information, such as uh, polymers and others. The Raman would be very good at looking at even things like tangles and plaques. And so these are some of the reasons we're doing this type of combination. I mentioned the ability to transcriptomics. This has been a very slow project, but it's actually at the point now where it's working. This is some work with Jim Everwine. He's visited here many times, uh, active collaborator a long time ago with uh, Bill Greeno. So Jim Everwine was the person in 1991 who published the first single cell transcriptomics. That gives him uh, some papers with some ridiculous number of citations. Uh, we could only all hope to get something like that. But what he is doing now, he actually didn't think this would work and neither did we, but we are, my group helps teach a Cold Spring Harbor course on single cell analysis. He did transcriptomics, we did mass spec, and um, we basically said, why couldn't we do the two the, together? And this is basically uh, our cells scattered. Here are some individual cells. We can do mass spec and we see the here, and then we can actually take these cells and send them to him, the Everwine lab. And when we do that, um, we can actually get between about 500 and 15,000 transcripts rep representing, in good cases, three to 5,000 different proteins on the individual cell um, after mass spectrometry. So we did many steps wrong for transcriptomics. We didn't do an RNA uh, ACE inhibitor. We didn't do other things. We didn't do the right solutions. And even then, uh, this can work quite well. The issue now is trying mostly what we see as lipids, which are hard to relate to transcripts, and we're trying to then do the informatics to figure out what this means. Last few minutes, make sure I'm so slowly, yeah, okay, so I'm probably talking a few minutes a little bit fast. I wanted to end by showing you where the group can go with a challenging analytical question, and that is how small can you go? Can you go to individual organelles? Now, obviously, the cell is sort of in some ways the fundamental unit of life, we talk about neurons and astrocytes, talk about, you know, red blood cells, glial, and so they build up to form function. But obviously, a cell is not a, a membrane full of chemicals in transcript. It's, it's full of different organelles. One of the important categories of organelle are dense core vesicles. In the year 2000, Stoss and my group did a heroic experiment where he isolated individual vesicles, put them on a slide, this is an atrial vesicle or a red hemiduct or an electron lucent vesicle, and we could get pretty poor quality spectra on those. We also have a SIMS instrument where we could look at vitamin E in specific locations, but I'm going to show you that. So this was it's a well-cited heroic paper, but we, it was hard to reproduce. There was a lot of hand uh, manipulations. And so two weeks ago, uh, a study that was just published involving Stas also and Elena, but Richard's for the informatics and also an incredible amount of work with Dan Castro, um, made this work uh, using our MicroMS automated system. Now, it's not really automated. You have to isolate things. And this took a lot of different steps. Here's an image of dense core vesicles. You, you use an image mass to find the vesicles. These are can be under a micron to about a you know 1.5 micron, so these are larger than typical dense core vesicles. You now know the locations. You make sure that they're separated enough that a laser will only hit one. In a few cases, we use the EM available to Beckman. Here's a single object that's, you know, it could be submicron now that we did electron microscopy on. That means we could guide the laser. We can hit the sample. And well, in the last 20 years, mass spectrometers got a lot better. These are some of the lipids as well as lipid addicts in a single cell. And I just wanted to put this up because it's basically, these are some of the peptides that are found in indiv individual vesicles over actually a couple months. And this is mass error, just saying over an extended mass range using our system, not just lipids, we can see peptide hormones um, and get very high quality data. And the reason this is important is as the amount of material goes down, your ability to accurately determine what the compound is, is harder. It becomes less. And yet even so we're getting really high quality data on what's in individual vesicles. So then we expanded this and did a couple hundred vesicles, almost a thousand vesicles. Um, again, lipids, this is a mass spectra showing identified compounds. The names are a little bit weird, acidic peptide. B3-5 is a prohormone that was found in the uh, 
buccal ganglia, what's it doing in the atrial gland, vesicles, I don't know. But when you do unsupervised learning, or in this case, k-means clustering, actually, we see that the vesicles that contain one set, we thought, of peptides cluster into three different groups, each group having different uh, comp, you know, contents. And on the right is violin plots, where you have masses or peptides, and then basically the amount for each of them. And what's interesting is these vesicle classes don't have compounds A, B, and C for vesicle class 1, 2, and 3. Uh, what they have is overlapping but slightly different levels of each of these peptides. And so you have one set of you know, cells that are making vesicles that have slightly different amounts of these peptides, and they really do uh, cluster into individual you know, groups. And again, each dot, which is really kind of phenomenal about this, is an individual vesicle. So that's how we're dealing with this. When we submitted this to Nature Methods, they said that's really good. Prove it works by showing at least one more vesicle class. And you have, you know, a couple weeks to get the data to us, which is ridiculous, except that we already had the data and weren't sure what to do with it. So we then threw this in. And I considered this less interesting. We didn't put it in the paper, but then it suddenly got added quick. And so this is using, on the right, that other vesicle class, the uh, electron lucent vesicles. But actually, they're a bit, you know, I don't think the reviewers understood in aplesia, this is a very strange vesicle. It is electron lucent, but it doesn't have a bilayer. It has a unit membrane. That's why it's so weird. And you know, we actually have those too uh, in the mammal, but you know, and, and but they're not neuronal or endocrine or exocrine. But our software was able to find these green dots, which are the vesicles. There's actually some weird, or in this case, it's some uh, spermatozoan and some destroyed things. And so we can actually look at one slide and pick out the different vesicles, and we can. Sort them based on this, in this particular case, the TSNE type clustering and say these two vesicle classes from the same animal, very close location, have very different lipids. And you can see that here. This is, it's kind of hard to see. There's gray and this uh, brownish red. And those are the lipids, not just amounts, but they're actually different molecular weights found between these two vesicle classes, one of which will do fusion, you know, a, a lipid bilayer, and one of which does this uh, probably closer to um, uh, uh, holocrine secretion. And then this is just a, a basically, in essence, a loading plot with a lot of other detail on some of the identified lipids. And so you get a lot of information. And if you really want to know the confusion matrix, it's just simply saying how many times we make mistakes when categorizing them. But we have an extended mass range. We can see that even vesicle, you know, we tend to think of what's you know, what are the lipids in a cell membrane? What are the lipids in a vesicle? And the answer is, it really depends on which one you're looking at. There's an amazing heterogeneity. What that means in terms of how they're formed within cells is, is pretty staggering because you would tend to think of these as fairly similar. So I really wanted to make sure I gave time for questions, but I really wanted to kind of emphasize a few things. We can actually do a few objects with a lot of chemical detail or we can do lots of objects, tens of thousands, with less detail but higher throughput. Which one is better? It depends on the question. Now, we're now working with somebody who approached us and said, I think in a brain cancer case, there's a few metabolites at high levels. Can you determine this? And by the way, we're going to have tens of thousands of cells. And so we're asking a very specific question, and we're doing really high throughput. Other times, you know, there's just a few cells of interest, and you really need to know either quantitation or quality, you know, uh, more information on what's there. And so we do this all the time. You can't get everything at once. The other thing I want to say is even in the year 2021, you know, regardless of what your biochemistry textbook tells you, there's an amazing amount of unexplored neurochemistry, lipid chemistry, uh, and others. And so we keep on finding some. I didn't go into it, but we're exploring, you know, D-amino acids as neurotransmitters, how they're made, what they're doing. There's even some cofactors that we, you know, don't understand why they're there and what they're doing. So heterogeneity is high even in really well-defined cell types. And I would say alpha, beta, and gamma delta cells in a pancreas, you know, islet would have been the prototypical well-defined cell type. Um, you really do need single cell measurements. And then lastly, we keep on finding new molecules. Sometimes with the help of wonderful, talented collaborators like uh, Martha and others, we, we not only know that we're seeing something unusual, we actually eventually figure out uh, at least a function. I think one of the problems that we use, the way we use wording is we like to say serotonin has a particular function or a peptide has a particular function, and it's very specific to the specific 
location. As an example, an islet in a human, again, it's not a neuron, it's not a brain, and it uses things like, obviously, insulin and glucagon and pancreatic hormone. And by the way, it has dopamine, serotonin, acetylcholine, GABA, and glutamate. You discovered D-serine and D-alanine and D-aspartate in the brain as neuromodulators and things that impact NMDA receptors. They're all in an islet. So every one of the neurotransmitters that we've looked at, including nitric oxide, is in an islet. They're not neurotransmitters there, but they control the pulsatile release and the synchrony of an islet to get them to release insulin and these other peptides in the right way. So are those molecules neurotransmitters? Yes. Are they endocrine-related um, neuro, I mean, modulators, I keep on having to remove the word neuro, uh, modulators, the answer is yes. Um, you know, as another last example, that the organ outside of the brain, or, and actually the gut, because of the enteric nervous system, that has the most expression in terms of transcript of many neuropeptides is your skin. What neuropeptides are doing in your skin, I don't know. We haven't really studied that much. But again, when we use the word neuropeptide and hormone, Remember, they have many other functions in different organs, and so the, the pathways are very similar. Uh, they may even have the same receptors, but the function then is changed. And so with that, um, you know, I actually will add the last statement is I think we're getting to the point where some of our collaborators are applying us with brain organoids, and we're starting to get to the point where we can start asking whether or not organoids are actually making these type of complicated signaling molecules because they're required for not just function, they're required for development. Because the one thing I didn't go into is that in addition to adult fully developed cells, the other way these signaling molecules are used are basically patterning within the nervous system of other organs where you have to have chemical gradients. And the chemical gradients that are established during development, what do you know, are the peptides and transmitters and other molecules not being used that way, but is used as gradients to determine organization. And so I'm expecting to see, or hoping to see, those types of molecules uh, in this other role. And with that, I think I've now timed it well, and I would be happy to answer any questions. And for those of you on Zoom, I'm opening up the chat, so if anybody has a question that way, I'd be happy to answer it. Looking down, I'm looking. I'm not reading my emails. I'm looking at the chat. So that's a. <laughs> uh, I'm curious what kind of uh, clustering algorithms are used to uh, cluster all the different uh, cell types. Is that just regular uh, PDAs or um, those involved? It's a great question. Um, and I'm going to answer in a very unsatisfactory way and then try to justify it. We cluster, the, the clustering methods used depend on the person doing the work in the sense that. Everybody in the group and some of our programs do PCA really well, and so it's very simple. And um, we also use, you know, you know, the stochastic nearest neighbor embedding, PSNE, which is used a lot for transcriptomics and other data. And that's a visualization approach to visualize clusters. We, depending on the type of data, sometimes uh, we use, you know, supervised. You know, in the case of, um, in some cases, we know, for example, we have the cells from different brain regions or they stain differently, and then we would use a supervised approach that was a little different. Um, but it really depends both, both on the, the knowledge of the person doing it and then also what the goals are. When we tried to determine how what we, it, for example, that one experiment when we were doing, you know, in essence, um, clustering, we were using a machine learning approach really to see how well our data can be split, you know, in an unsupervised way into the, the, the brain regions or the categories that we knew existed. So that was, that was a little bit different. The reason I was a little hesitant to use that is I wanted to know not just how well we can segregate the data, I wanted to know what features enabled that. And that's why I was really happy when Richard uh, came up with this um, Shapley additive explanations because that allowed you to say, we can separate these into you know, the brain regions, and by the way, these are the lipid features or these are the features that allowed us to do that. And that's something that some machine learning approaches really are more of a black box and don't allow. But that's a lot of answers depending on what we're trying to address and also the person doing the experiments. So following up on that, when you code like your ASOC composition, do you get a sense, like an intuitive sense, what those like uh, what those components are? Like, what does those like a problem spectrum represent? Like, so that's a great question. 
So when you, this is why I was happy about the eyelet work, because in some ways, every approach separated, and then you say, oh, look, this cluster has glucagon and all the glucagon related, and this has, you know, so, you know, insulin or pancreatic hormone or, you know, has uh, some had amylin. And so, you know, all that worked out well. One of the things that bothered me a lot is when we did an islet and we used principal component analysis or others, about half the cells had no peptides. And the other half were really great into these alpha, beta, gamma, delta cells with a few others. And I thought that was us damaging the cells. So that's fine, right? You know, you, you shake it up and you take an islet apart and some of them leak out. Okay. There was a transcriptomics paper published uh, in Cell where they did a couple thousand uh, cells and they came to the conclusion that about half the cells in an islet aren't those canonical peptide producing cells, but are the cells that line the blood vessels, the cells that hold it together, the really small and things. And so they said, look, half the cells have no peptides and half are there. And so now I would like to pretend that that's exactly what we got. What I really don't know is of the cells that have nothing, how many were those and how many were damaged cells? Right, so that's, I, I, I still don't have a great feel for that, but I'm expecting some cells we hurt, you know, and uh, while well, isolating. But otherwise, in cases where we know what we're looking for, the data is very reassuring. In aplesia, we have 20 years of going to the abdominal ganglion and say that's the L7 neuron or the R3 through 14 or whatever, and the cerebral ganglion, those are the F cluster cells, and we should know what's in there. We've studied them manually, and when we do it this way, we get sort of the same type of information. So that also was making me happy. When you go to look at lipids in a brain region, I had, there's, no, I, there's, nobody to, there's no way to look at that. right? I can look at somebody who took the cerebellum from rodents and did a huge lipidomic measurement, and they got all these things, but there's nobody who separated the cell types out. So there, I have to trust ourselves, and that's why we've done all these other examples. If, you, if you're interested in the brain, why in the world did you go into islets? But that was the number one reason to sort of get what I thought would be a good cell type. Pituitary, we've done literally millions of pituitary cells using every approach because they make POMC and they make, you know, they should have, you know, the uh, um, oxytocin and vasopressin release there, and so at least we have known knowns that we can compare to. So it's a long answer. Sometimes they make intuitive sense and sometimes I have no idea. Okay. So you mentioned that in some in some cases you sort of know what you're looking for and they can just use that for the fact of sanity check mm -hmm. what the components means. Do you ever try to do like like similar to PC like a canonical correlation where you're looking at if you already sort of know what you're looking for, they can try to match um, the regularities that you can see, you know, when you're using PCA, and then see those very, uh, like, very in some structured way with whatever it is that pops up they try to look We do that as well as we can. Um, you know, I'm thinking, you know, outside of islets, outside of bag cell neurons, and some of the others um, in pituitary, you know, as I say, we got contacted and somebody said this particular compound should be in these cancer cells, and we did buckets of the cancer cells, and we did LC mass spec, and we saw that. We did transcriptomics, and this sort of makes sense, but we don't know how variable it is, and we just got the first batches of cells, and there does seem to be a really good segregation with maybe only a few percent of the cells. So you get a tail of this amount, you know, in non-cancerous cells, and, th and there is a little bit of overlap, and we're just trying to understand that. So there's a few cases when we can, we can do what you're saying, but there haven't been that many, you know. Um, you know, we, there's probably other places we can do that. I would say the most staggeringly, I mean, just a, a very interesting case that we, the person graduated and they haven't gone back to is, you know, besides the CNS, there's the enteric nervous system. And part of the enteric nervous system aligns your gut, um, makes the entero, um endocrine cells make peptides. And these are GLP. And as I mentioned, uh, you know, the GLP-like, there's... Um, EYY, there's a couple others. So there's seven or eight pro-hormones. And we got approached by somebody after one of our Cold Spring Harbor classes saying, I'm doing transcriptomics on these cells, and I find some cells that make pro-hormone one, some make two, some make three, but some make one and three, some make one and five, some make two, three, four. So it's really complicated. So we tried that, and it didn't work because only one in 10,000 cells in the gut 
make these, but they were able to make a mouse that had all the enteroendocrine cells fluorescent. Now we can find them, and we measure those, and what we found, it was almost combinatorial. Some cells truly, you know, if there's eight prohormones that we could detect, had one, two, three, and six, others had four, five, six, seven, and eight, and so there wasn't eight canonical types of enteroendocrine cells. There was, you know, whatever you want to say, eight factorial. It was worse than that, though, because there was some evidence that changed depending on the state of the animal. So what we can't do, unfortunately, is our measurement uses up the cell. You know, if somebody just, you know, somebody, if a, if a mouse just ate, do the cells change because they need something? If they're low blood sugar, does it change? You know, if they're getting old, does it change? I don't know if the neuroendocrine cells change their peptide complement based on activity or behavior or state. All I can say is that if you take an animal and look at it, it's much more complicated than people would expect. And it may be that, you know, cell types that make one peptide are not really as common as people think. I wish we had a way of repeatedly measuring the same cell, but that is something we're trying to get a hold of. But again, that project sort of ended when people graduated and it was unfunded and just kind of cool. Um, but I don't, you know, in the brain, the problem is you wouldn't know you have the same cell type each time. The great questions. I wish I had good answers. <laughs> Martha, so then. talking more about the eyelids, the last eyelid slide you had showed quite strikingly that just like one or two cells had whatever it was you were looking at, mm -hmm. and and some of them were quite dark. Functionally, what's going on? I mean, are those? And I guess they're endocrine cells, the type. But can that single cell provide the functional output that the eyelid's supposed to provide? I know you're a Renaissance man, so I know you can deal with this question. <laughs> I'm thinking of, I can answer it. I was trying to decide which pathway to take in terms of answering it. Um, eyelets are really complicated, and the more I learn, the more complicated they get. Now, I will say the other thing is that people tend to have a, a theory about how eyelet functions, and they tend to guard them. And we ended up getting this visionary award from the American Diabetes Association. It's a really pretentious name, so ignore that. But we're not funded by NIH or anybody else. And so we're sort of pre-game. People want to give us samples and, and, and help us in really fun ways. And so nobody has said no to any request. It's really a little bit interesting, partly because they know I'm, you know, I, I, I didn't know how to spell eyelet before I started this. Um, so two things. One, eyelets come in all sorts of sizes. Probably the average eyelet, which goes against everything I showed you and everything you'll read about, could be 30 to 50 cells, and it only has beta cells with a couple alpha cells. All those others aren't there. And then as they get bigger, you start adding all these other things. And there's some evidence that, you know, when you have type 1 diabetes, you keep on killing islets, and yet you don't show any symptoms for, you know, long time. Why? Because these small islets suddenly become big, they make more cells, there's, and they take over the responsibility. And so, um, you know, that's one of the issues is that it's, it's probably a dynamic, but if most of the islets are 30 to 50 cells, then maybe one or two cells is enough. I don't know how to exactly address that. However, with the big mega islets that contain a couple thousand plus cells, there's a lot of evidence that when you change glucose levels, they release peptides, and that doesn't matter. What it is is they release peptides in a very complex pulsatile way, and those pulses allow them to tailor what they have to release. So if you put an islet in a microfluidic device and you maintain things and you look at calcium waves, you look at uh, other signaling, you do electrophysiology, uh, as well as look at output, these weird pulsatile secretions that change in frequency are what determine what's released. And in that case, having one or two cells releasing something can have a drastic impact on this weird long-term pulsatile secretion of insulin, another cell releasing a little bit of GABA or glutamate or even another peptide can change that. And so that's when it would matter. The problem, of course, is that that's been studied at more in rodent islets. When, you know, this is going to sound bad, but when you take a human sample in a human islet, you know, the person died violently. They're not given to you right away. You can buy human islets. They're transplant quality but they don't act quite the same way. People in some of the hospitals can get them to work where you see this pulsatile secretion, but that's a lot harder to do, and it only works some of the time. And so that's a problem is that, you know, now you're really talking about a physiologically functioning islet as opposed to what's in it. 
and we haven't gotten to that. We are collaborating with uh, somebody at, in Florida who is actually doing those experiments to see if we can see those type of effects. So it's a really good question. But there's a lot of heterogeneity with islets, size, shape, cell types, and even the fact that it can change as the body needs to change. There's some people who have transcriptomic evidence that if you were to kill all the beta cells in an islet, some of the alpha cells, I mean, there's also that you have progenitor, you know, undifferentiated cells, but when all those are gone, some of the alpha cells can de-differentiate and then come back to become a beta cell. So there's a lot of plasticity. Now, is that really happening or just by transcriptomics? Are they still making peptides? We're trying to address that, but the problem is I don't trust our cell isolation. If we have an alpha cell that has a little insulin, is it is because it's in this process or because we've got a little bit of beta cell stuck to it? And that's where I'm, I'm having a hard time addressing that, but it's a great question that gets to the heart of a lot of even neuroscience is when can cells change? You know, I'm gonna add, I'll throw this out. Astrocytes are different in different parts of the drain, brain. But you can ask a question, how many astrocyte types are there? It could be one astrocyte type, but by transcriptomics or our approach, they look different because an astrocyte next to a bunch of GABA-producing cells have to do the, GABA, the glutamate shuttle. They take up the GABA, they convert it, and they send it back to the neuron. But an astrocyte next to dopamine cells has to have a completely different set of neurochemical pathways activated. So does an astrocyte in those two locations, they're going to look differently, but they may be the same cell, meaning if you change the location, it would just happily adapt its neurochemical pathways. So one is a, when I think of cell type, it means you can't change back and forth, right? There, there could be an astrocyte, which is the jack of all trades, that does what it needs to do based on its environment. So there's a lot of different states of an astrocyte, or it could be they're different. And so... That's a really hard question to get at because within the context of a particular brain slice, it's going to be in a particular state, but it can change. We've done metabolomics of some cells when we pluck them out and see differences in 24 hours in culture, those differences are completely gone. So again, it's really hard to think about cell state versus cell type because we're taking a snapshot and I don't even know what that means. This is... Uh, what I want to say, that's a, you, you've got to be very careful because some people, there's a lot of money in making an atlas of the cells of the brain. And they want them, to, everybody wants these to be different types. I'm just not convinced. You know, we're all different, but I was going to say we also are different when we come to University of Illinois and when we leave, you're a different per, you know, person. And that's a, that's a, to my way of thinking, that's not changing who you are. That's just within the subcontext of state. That's really what I'm getting at. When we thought of Mali as a restrictive technique, so in one of your slides where you were showing the mass spectra of things from single cells, you said that you were able to get mass spectra from using different instruments from the same cell, right? So I was wondering how your team managed to do that. So you have a microscope slide, you know, you, you find that, you know, you have all these letters on it. And we image it with the microscope, we figure out where the letters are, and then we figure out where all the cells are relative to all those letters. We put this into the mass spectrometer, we basically line up this and say, there's the I and there's the L, and the, you know, so we figured out the location. And then we say, go to cell number one, two, three, four, and five by location. And we hit them. When we blast them with the, the laser, we're only, okay, we're, we're crazy. We used radioactively labeled cells. Well, don't even worry, you know, this is just a crazy idea I had when people didn't believe this would work. We did the mass spectrometry, but 1% of the peptides were radioactive. We took the slide out, we measured how much radioactivity was left on a phosphorimager. We did it again, saw the same thing, and measured it. And I can tell you that we're losing 10 to 20% of the material for each measurement. Now, by mass spectrometry, we still see a lot is left, but people didn't believe that, so that's why we used the radioactivity. Um, we've done that for small molecules and peptides. Um, it never did that for lipids. Uh, so we can make the same measurement three or four times. What we also did is we have an XY translation stage, and we can say, take this capillary and go to the location that cell 579 is at and suck it up. And then we did capillary electrophoresis. So we can do that, unfortunately, uses up the rest of the cell. So we can do Molitoff, or we can do SIMS, or we can do Solarix. And 
then we can do CE. Now, we don't normally do that at all, but we've done two types of measurements often. The other thing that's amazing is that when the cells are dried and have this acidic matrix, many of the compounds are pretty stable. You can measure it a week later, two weeks later, it's not a problem. If you want to know oxidation of methionine or oxidation of lipids, this approach will not work. Why? Because I don't believe the microscope slide sitting out. Because I've had people say, oh, you're seeing oxidized lipids. This will tell you the oxidative stress of the brain. And I don't believe that because, unfortunately, once we put the cell on the microscope slide, it starts to oxidize. So if you don't care about oxidation, our approach is really good. But if you want to know what proteins or lipids were oxidized, I would have to really think we'd have to do everything in a dry box, and that would be a major pain. I'm trying to understand the interest of how you reconcile like the machine learning methods with what you're interested in. Like you showed in the example where you had the two principal components plus the new thing. Mm -hmm. I believe. So like obviously you can choose how many clusters right. um, when you do the method, right? So when so you right now can show three clusters, is that being done sort of by domain expertise you expect there to be three different things? Or, or is that being done in some sort of like cross audited way? Wait, so that was done in a cross-validated way. We also changed the number of features we looked at. We actually looked, used um, about 20% of the, uh, the, I think in that case it was about 20% of the samples, the, the spectra, looked at the number of clusters, used those to see how they correlated. with the, So we did a couple things. Sometimes, so there's a lot of studies, and I'm trying to answer in a vague way because um, they're all different. And the way we did the, the the different endocrine cells in uh, pink, you know, in islets was very different because every technique gave us the same answer no matter what we did, because that is the best possible case. Some of the cells have these peaks, and to be honest, a beta cell in an islet, some people claim 40 to 50% of the metabolism is making insulin prohormone, and a glucagon cell is 30%. So they look sort of the same cell. They are so different that it doesn't matter what you do, they cluster by cell type. Right? That's the perfect example of, of and, and not only that, the peaks are absolutely in the sweet spot of our system to detect. So alpha, beta, gamma, delta cells plus a few mixed, that is absolutely robust. You can't go wrong. I shouldn't say that. I'm sure there is a way to go wrong, but in some ways, it didn't matter. Um, the three vesicle classes, um, we tried to validate it in different ways, and really it kept them, you know, it was three. When you looked at the 80 to 100 clusters from the cerebellum, where we're looking at lipid classes, that really dictate, really depended on how we did the clustering. You could get an arbitrary number. Um, we picked that number of clusters because um, the differences were ascribable to the lipids that we could tentatively or uh, presumably, you know, identify. So we can get some chemical information, and, and so there was something to be said for that. But the number of clusters in some of that type of data, uh, it, especially when you have thousands to hundreds of thousands, or like in the uh, human development case, um, it really depends on the parameters you pick. And I'm not sure, you know, we don't have any way to really prove that because we have no other way of looking at those cells. So I, I guess uh, following up on that, it, I, I'm not sure I understand because I don't really chemistry is not my thing, um, but so you were mentioning differences in like class versus like or type versus State. Um, so if you were to like see a cluster, for instance, you have three clusters here. Um, All I can, th that's going to be just what we put into the instrument. I can't say anything in that particular case about whether tomorrow those would be the same. The only way I could do that is to repeat the same measurement on a similar sample. If that makes sense. So that is, I was telling you something based on a bunch of experiments, but not in the clustering because we would repeat an experiment, you know. For example, we would take a particular name cell type out, we would measure it, we would actually take the same cell type out, culture it for 24 hours or 36 hours, and we would see differences. And then in that particular case, for example, even in aplesia between the B1 and B2 neurons, which we could easily cluster after 24 hours of culturing, they were identical. No clustering would segregate them based on the B1 and B2. So there was a case where we would see differences between two named cells that have different physiology. That's why they're identified neurons with different names. And those differences would go away 24 hours after culturing them. So presumably, whatever was in the environment that was keeping those cells different was lost under culturing conditions. 
It's very concerning. Well, I don't know what to say. It's, it's kind of fun because it basically says cell culture is not necessarily ideal. And a lot of what we do isn't cell culture. I mean, I don't want to say it's concerning or not. It's, it's, it's an observation. You know, I have a lot of people who, for example, would say, don't use aplesia. Don't use, you know, brain sciences. Use cell cultures. You, you know, I, I work on cell lines, and it's the right way to go, and they're human cell lines. Why are you using rodent? It's a human cell line. And the answer is you can get some information with that. It's great. I'm not picking on that. But a cell line from a particular brain region, you know, a pituitary that had cancer that you kept, you know, this is the ATT, you know, the, was it AT20 cells or whatever, after, you know, I don't know how many passages, generations, is not really a human cell line anymore or a rodent cell line. It's, it's different. And a good example of how it's different is most of the lipid heterogeneity is lost. Why is it lost? Because when you buy a cell culture of media, there's two possibilities. One, there's only a dozen lipids added, and the rest of the complexity is not there. Or two, what a lot of people do is they say the cells don't grow right, so we'll take the serum from the fetal calf, that has whatever it has in it. And by the way, the reason people like to use fetal calf serum is it has a hundred times more than it should in terms of growth factors, right? So it overloads every possible receptor with every possible growth factor because that's what the fetal calf is doing is growing really fast. And so those cells will grow like crazy. But what's funny is if we do proteomics of cell lines that use fetal calf serum and then you wash it away and let it grow for 24 hours without, when we do proteomics, the, the, some of the largest proteins we detect are now listed as a cow. They're not, you know, you're working with rat cell lines and you say, how come we're getting cow proteins? Well, that's because you grew it in cow protein. And so it incor happily incorporated those into it. And so that's also different. I mean, right? And so is that concerning? I don't know what to say. There's, there's no real good answer. The brain is up here surrounded by a skull. And we're trying to extract cells. And either we damage the brain in getting them out we took a brain slice, which damaged the brain, but has some benefits. We took cells from it. We took cancerous cell lines. Or maybe we used an animal that didn't have a skull that we can do other things to. But every one of those has problems. And so one of the reasons with these statistical approaches and others, we're trying to figure out where those problems are so we can accommodate them. I mean, you know, brain organoids are great. They have a lot of positives, but who knows exactly how well they recapitulate. And that's what we're trying to help find, right? You know, you can see... Morphology, you can see electrophysiology. We're trying to add a chemistry part of that. How well does it work? Obviously, it's different. There's no blood flow and other things. So I don't know if I would say it bothers me. I just want to know what variables I have to worry about or control. And the only thing that's interesting is you end up with a new measurement tool, and then you have to control new variables. <laughs> always also saying that what the cell is expressing is not completely endogenous, but it's really regulated by yeah. the cells and the yeah. soluble environment around it. Yes, that's absolutely true, which will not be uniform and anyway. that's not surprising. No, that's right. You know, it's, um, I think that's something that people don't, you know, people want there to be this great relationship between, you know, your genome, your transcriptome, the proteome, the proteins present, which then regulate the metabolome, the small molecules. And yet, the metabolome is not just what the proteins made, but it's the proteins of all the neighboring cells and what the lymphatic and the blood and everybody else delivered to it. And that's a little bit or a lot different. When it comes to lipids, it's a lot different. When it comes to other categories of molecules, it's probably not as different. And so if those molecules matter, then you need to follow them in a different way. You can't just look at the transcriptome. So that's sort of, you know, one take on message. So does that mean that you can actually make the inference that the actual function of the cell is depend on the location? Yeah. It depends on context, location. You know, the, you know what I always think is interesting is when... NIH has put in hundreds of millions of dollars to determine how many cell types there are. And I 
got to listen to those meetings every two weeks for about a year and a half, and finally I quit. I just didn't go anymore because I came to the conclusion that cell type is a semantic discussion and not a science discussion because you can have two identical dorsal root ganglia cells, one of which has a receptive field here and one here. If you stick a pin in this one, one fires. You stick a pin here, the other one fires. I don't know why I'd be sticking pins in my hand, but okay. And so they're different cells. They have different locations. Location matters, but they might have the same transcripts. So one group would say they're the exact same cell. The physiologist would say, how can you call it the same cell? They're not superimposable. They do different things. And so location matters, the direction of field matters, and yet it depends on what you're trying to address. Now, you know, then that matters in some types of disease, too, because depending on where location is, et cetera, some cells would be damaged or not. And so this all matters depending on really, you know, is, uh, what you're trying to address. But it's a good question. I think we're going late. I don't want to, oh, we're way late. You guys are very patient. But great questions. I'm happy to answer any more. And I think everybody online is left, so that's perfect. <laughs> no, there's still six, but I don't know how many are. How many were online? Um, oh, look at that. There are people from my group. I should have noticed that. Actually, there's not six because one of them counts me. Yeah, and three of us are in the room. Managing. Yep. Okay. So, or some people are still on and they just went away to dinner, though. No. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you all. And I'm happy to, you know, you're, you're, some great questions on uh, some of the uh, informatics, and so we're happy to address that. And the best way is, you know, I can put you in contact with the people who do some of the work. But we're still learning on how to deal with this kind of data. Thank you all. Well, thank you, Jonathan.